Hello and welcome to the channel. In this, our first video, we will take a closer look at the Omaha Beach landing on D-Day. The Allies in 1944 were in a very strong position. They had total control of the air and sea with a seemingly endless logistical supply chain, but they still faced the task to retake the land and countries that had been lost to the Axis forces over the previous four years of war in Europe. This involved the most challenging aspect of the war so far, directly assaulting the European continent. A European invasion required the assault of multiple beaches with the intention of creating a big enough lodgment area to fight off the counter-attacking Panzer armies. The Axis forces would seek to push the Allied armies back into the sea. Assaulting beaches is particularly complicated as it is also affected by the sea state, tides, sandbanks of the approaches and the physical makeup of the beach itself. Add to this the strength and number of fixed defences of the enemy, then a beach assault has the potential for disaster for the attacking force. Even with all the advances of military technology and the manufacturing resources of the Allies, direct assault still required ordinary soldiers and men to cross the open ground, to engage the enemy, to take the ground and eventually hold it. Technology can help, but it fell to the infantry to do the hard miles. In this first video we will look at what factors made the Omaha Beach the hardest 300 yards in D-Day, and why it had to be taken. Looking at the map of Europe in 1942-43, the black area shows Hitler's German Reich. The dark grey shows areas that are occupied or under military control, and the light grey are the German Allies. The United Kingdom is shown in green, while the Soviet Union is in pink. The Russian Winter Offensive in 1942 started to make inroads into the Nazi-controlled areas, which is shown in checkered pink and black, and this advance continued over the following years, as the tide turned. The Russian armies and people had suffered greatly in the war so far. Churchill and Roosevelt had agreed with Stalin at the Trident Conference held in West Washington in May 1943 to undertake a cross-English Channel invasion in 1944 to open up a second front. A successful landing in Western Europe, combined with the industrial strength of the United States and the rest of the Allies, would seal the defeat of Germany. The second front would open up on D-Day and would also be the start of the Battle of Normandy. Getting the Allies back into Western Europe was also important as the post-war map of Europe was being rewritten as Stalin's armies progressed across Eastern Europe. These are a number of views of Omaha Beach as it is today. In the months prior to D-Day, two men, one a sapper and the other from the Special Boat Squadron, swam ashore on the planned Omaha landing area where they took samples from the beach to see if tanks could be supported. This was done on all the landing areas after the issues the Allies experienced with the disastrous raid on Dieppe. On their return from the mission, a meeting was set up to review their findings. This was attended by six admirals and five generals, including General Bradley himself. The attendance at this meeting underlines the concern there was for the Omaha landings and the state of the beach. The sapper gave his report and the end added, Sir, I hope you don't mind me saying, but this beach is a formidable pro proposition, indeed, and there are bound to be tremendous casualties. Where would the Allied landings in Europe be carried out? This was the critical question to both the Allies as they were attacking, and Hitler who was organising the defence. As mentioned earlier, the Allies had carried out an assault on Dieppe in France, which had been a failure in some ways, but there were many lessons learnt which could be applied to the invasion of Europe. For the assault into Europe, the Allies decided not to attack a heavily defended port again. This was too obvious. For the landings themselves, close air and artillery support for troops was essential. Having air superiority was critical, which required keeping aircraft over the landing zones as long as possible. To provide this air support, the available British aircraft had limited range which left four prime areas to land, Brittany, the Continent Peninsula, Normandy and the Pas de Calais. 
Brittany and Contina are peninsulas, which would mean the Germans could have cut off and bottled up the Allied advance to a relatively narrow area, so these sites were rejected. This left two possibilities. Pas de Calais, only 21 miles from the English coast, and was the closest point. This would seem to be the natural choice. Hence the Germans had heavily fortified the area, and also inland from the coast, exploitation or expansion would be hampered by the multiple rivers and canals. This left Normandy. This area provided a broader front and exploitation opportunities to Cherbourg, Brittany and Paris. It was further away from England and there were limited port facilities. In its favour, the Normandy area was close to Cherbourg, which had a deep water port. It was also close to the road and rail hub of Cannes, which would be good for future logistics movements. Eventually, Normandy was chosen as the area for landing back into Western Europe. Preparation for the Normandy landings. For the Normandy landings, General Dwight D. Eisenhower was appointed Supreme Commander, and General Bernard Montgomery was named as Commander of all Allied ground forces. The 21st Army Group would make the attack. General Dwight D. Eisenhower brought the ability to bring together the forces of many nations into a coordinated fighting force, which had done in earlier landings in North Africa and Italy. Field Marshal Montgomery brought organisation and planning to the role. He was also a leader who had shown great compassion for the lives of the soldiers he commanded. In preparation for the landings, detailed information of the Normandy area was researched and investigated. In parallel, the Allies undertook a bombing campaign to wear down the supporting infrastructure and resources in France and Germany. This was split between tactical bombing on targets in France to more strategic bombing of factories in Germany. This campaign happened in all potential landing areas considered. In December 1943, Montgomery reviewed the existing plans which had been drawn up earlier in the war for the landings in Normandy and decided to expand the width and size from three divisions to five divisions and thus the landing grounds of Utah and Sword became part of the plan. Utah was added to the plan as Montgomery wanted the land on the Contina Peninsula as it would allow an advance in the deepwater port of Cherbourg. Hitler recognised and so did the Allies that significant logistics was required for a sustained attack into Europe and a deep water port is required for this. The major ports on the coast were thus very heavily defended. Sword Beach was added, targeting the road and rail hub of Cannes. Overall, the Omaha Beach was needed to link the landings in Utah on the far left to the main landings in the Normandy area, Gold, Juno and Sword. The plan was then for a five division assault onto the five separate landing grounds in Normandy. Three airborne divisions would precede the landing beach landings earlier in the day to secure the ground on the flanks. This would require a logistics plan to transport and land nearly 176,000 troops, 3,000 artillery pieces, 1,500 tanks and 15,000 other vehicles and was codenamed Operation Neptune. This became commonly known as D-Day and was part of the overall Operation Overlord. Out of the five beaches on D-Day, Oma stood out as the greatest challenge. The broader five division front would make it difficult for the Germans to concentrate their mobile forces to push the Allies back into the sea. The broader front also made it more likely to develop a firm lodgment area in Europe. As there may be delay in getting a deep water port at Cherbourg, the Allies created a contingency by bringing along their own ports for post-D-Day logistics in the form of the Mulberry Harbours. The Mulberry Harbours would take the form of two artificial ports consisting of outer breakwaters and inner concrete structures. The Allies also planned to run a pipeline for fuel across the channel. The construction and transport of the Mulberry Harbours was one of the best kept secrets of the war. The landings on the beaches signalled the start of the Battle of Normandy. The Allies needed to take 
and hold ground while the Axis had to push the landing forces back into the sea. This action was critical to the future of Western Europe and is why the cost and lies to the Axis and Allies forces on some of the days in the battle that follows exceeded the Somme or Verdun from the First World War. Such was the stakes at risk for both sides. The visual shows the map of the coast and beach area for Omaha, which would be the only choice for mass infantry and equipment landings and the logistics to follow. The overall plan for D-Day was by midnight that the landing forces from the five beachheads would have linked up to form a contiguous line against the Germans. For Omaha, the landing force consisted of the 116th Regimental Combat Team, which is from the 29th US Infantry Division. Alongside them was the 16th Regimental Combat Team from the famous Big Red One, US 1st Infantry Division. These two groups, once landed, would need to proceed an average of four to five miles to meet the target set gain line for day one. The, US, the 29th US Infantry Division was made up of four battalions of the US National Guard in February 1942. It trained from this point on and was eventually transported to England. In 1943, they conducted further training in Devon, which had similar beaches as Normandy. The 1st US Infantry Division had been reformed and refurbished with new equipment on the 15th of March 1942. It was part of the amphibious assault of North Africa and the invasion of Sicily. It returned to England in November 1943 to train for the invasion of Europe and was thus experienced in beach landings. Alongside the 29th and 1st US Infantry Divisions, companies A, B and C of the 2nd Ranger Battalion landed. They were to play a critical role later. The geography of Omaha Beach was a significant hurdle. It is six miles long with steep cliffs or banks on either end. It is the only feasible landing beach between Carrington Estuary on the Cherbourg Peninsula and Arrow Mache. Omaha was on the western end of the British beaches. The beach was in the shape of a gentle crescent as you can see from this video. There are four main exits and one minor exit from the beach where the bluffs are not so steep. This is the D1 draw today, with the road leading to the settlement of Burville. In 1944, the hard road also existed, which made this a perfect exit from the beach for trucks, troops and tanks. In the foreground, some of the defensive bunkers still remain. As you can see from the video, the high ground provided a perfect platform for the defenders. As well as the bluffs overlooking the beach, the waters of the shore held challenges. The beach is exposed to northerly and easterly winds with rocky ledges and outcrops creating offshore riptides and currents making any approach to the beach very difficult. Above the high water mark on the beach is an embankment which leads to a stretch of shingle culminating in a seawall. Beyond the seawall is a level area linking to the bluffs. This is the D3 exit, the group of houses then known as Les Moulins. The hard road which exists today did not exist in 1944. This is the E1 exit leading to Saint Laurent. The 1st Infantry Division had a costly fight to break out of the killing ground on this part of the beach. The E3 exit leads to Colville which was a major defence on the right flank of this area, and the site of WN62, which was known as the Butcher of Omaha. And finally, the smallest exit, later known as F1 Caberg. Although the beach is six miles long, only 0.7 of a mile is in the areas around these five exits. The limited exits funneled those landing onto the beach and provided focus of fire for the defenders. The troops assaulting the Omaha beach had to deal with the difficult waters off the shore, 
On landing, they had the bluffs overlooking the beach, and then finally dealing with the limited number of exits. It is without doubt the terrain favoured the defenders and hindered the attackers. Defence of the Beach As early as December 1941, Adolf Hitler ordered a new west wall to protect the countries which had been captured during the early part of the war. The planned line of this defensive wall can be seen on the map, marked as a green line, which stretched from Norway to the border between France and Spain. Had the US 1st and 29th Divisions landed at Omaha on the 6th of June 1943, they would not have faced anything more than a brisk walk across the beach, as there was no obstacles, machine guns or hard points. As the war progressed and as the tide was turning against Hitler and his armies, Hitler knew that invasion into Western Europe was likely, if not certain. In November 1943, Hitler issued Directive 51, which was to create an effective defensive barrier in Western Europe to stop an invasion. To implement Directive 51, Hitler appointed General Erwin Rommel, known as the Desert Fox from the North African Campaign, as the Inspector General of Defences in the West. Initially, Rommel was given an advisory role, with staff but no soldiers. There was a split in the thinking of how to stop an invasion in Western Europe. Rommel believed that the Allies needed to be opposed at the landing grounds and then counterattacked prior to allowing a bridgehead to be formed. On the other hand, Gert von Rundstedt, who was Commander-in-Chief West, believed that stopping the Allies near the beaches was not possible due to the firepower of the Allied navies. He wanted to hold the Panzer divisions well back near Paris and then use their pincer movement tactics to envelop the Allies. Rommel did not think this was possible as the Panzer divisions would be attacked and worn down by Allied air power, which he had seen in North Africa. In the end, a compromise was struck. The Atlantic Wall defences would be improved and would stretch along the coast of continental Europe and Scandinavia under the eye of Rommel. Rommel was also given the the control of the 7th and 15th armies, albeit Hitler held sway over the movement of the Panzer divisions. It has often been observed that the Atlantic Wall was a token defensive line mainly for propaganda purposes, but Rommel put his heart and soul into improving and to make it as best as it could be. Up to this point, coastal defence was in the hands of the German Navy, who had developed long-range, large-caliber guns for engaging warships to protect ports, as it was believed that the Allies would need a port to successfully invade. This thinking changed after the Dieppe Raid. The Dieppe Raid in August 1942 introduced mass landings on a beach by landing craft. This raised a need to the Germans for smaller-caliber, shorter-range weapons. The bombings carried out in support of Dieppe also raised the need for more protection for machine gun and larger gun emplacements. Rommel's inspection in December 1943 found that the coast outside the main ports was largely unprotected and open to attack. It was Rommel who organised the beach defences and gun positions at Omaha, with the troops working on these alongside civilians. Unfortunately, the troops were working on defences rather than training to fight, which, in retrospect, could have been a mistake. The area was defended by the static defence formations of the 716th Infantry Divisions, including three battalions made up of Red Army prisoners. It was generally perceived to be not as well trained as other German divisions. Mid-March 1944, Rommel had authorised one or two infantry battalions from the more powerful 352nd Infantry Division and a light artillery battalion to be moved into the area. Not the whole division, but still significant. The analysis from 21st Army Group on, on the makeup of the defensive troops that would be faced at Omaha was not totally clear. But it made no difference. For a cohesive landing on D-Day, Omaha had to be taken. Weapons and structures. We can look at some of the structures and weapons used to protect Omaha. This picture shows some of the furniture on and beyond the beach. 
Rommel had identified that the Navy did not have the resources to lay minefields off the coast from Omaha. The Germans then had taken the Czech hedgehogs and Belgian gates from the frontier defences from Czechoslovakia and Belgium. These usually had mines or ordnance with proximity fuses on them to damage the landing craft. The picture shows the mine-tipped concrete poles, concrete tetrahedrons, wooden stakes and tripod-mounted beams which would obstruct any landing operations on the beach. This is the infamous 88mm and was part of the Omaha beach defences. It was originally used as an anti-aircraft gun but was modified to an anti-tank rule. In this rule it was extremely effective and could defeat the frontal armour of any Allied tank in the war. It had a range out to 9.3 miles which it could cover the complete beach and had both armour piercing and high explosive shells. The HE shell was 23 pounds in weight and was fired at a muzzle velocity of 3,300 feet per second. The anti-tank round was 16 pounds and had a muzzle velocity of 3,707 feet per second. Also in the, def in the defences was the more common 75mm Pac-40. This anti-tank gun was used throughout the war and there was over 23,000 units produced. It had a HE round of 10 pounds which travelled at 1,500 feet per second and an anti-tank round of 8 pounds which travelled at 3,200 feet per second. The range for firing an HE shell was 4.7 miles. This picture shows the more dated German 7.5cm field cannon or infantry gun which was an uh, updated gun than the one used in World War I. It had a 14 pound shell and a muzzle velocity of 1800 feet per second. Range is approximately 3.75 miles. The 50 mm KWK L42 and L60 were very successful anti-tank guns used throughout the war. A number of these weapons were deployed at Omaha. Generally, the shell weight was 4 pounds with a muzzle velocity of between 1800 and 3700 feet per second. The L60 variant had a longer barrel than the L42. The MG34 is regarded as the first general purpose machine gun. It is a recoil operated air cooled with a maximum rate of fire of 1500 rounds per minute, depending on version practically 150 rounds per minute. Muzzle velocity was 2,500 feet per second. Maximum range was 1.2 miles or 2.1 miles with a tripod and telescopic sight. It used the Mauser 7.62 by 57 mm round. The MG42 performed pretty much the same as the MG34 except it was cheaper and quicker to make. The German 5cm light mortar launched a 2 pound shell a third of a mile at a rate of 15 to 25 rounds per minute. The German 8cm mortar was used for support throughout the war and was known for its accuracy and rate of fire. The shell fired was 7 pounds, 11 ounces, rate of fire 15 to 25 rounds per minute with a maximum range of 1.5 miles. This shows a Tobruk, which was usually a circular reinforced concrete bunker with an opening at the top. Generally they were designed to be used with a machine gun. In this case there is a turret of a French Renault tank. Panzer IV turrets were also used. This is a German Flak 38. 20mm light anti-aircraft gun which could also be used in an anti-personnel role. There were 40,000 plus of the Flak 38s built throughout the war. They fired a 20mm shell to a maximum distance of approximately 3 miles with a muzzle velocity of 2,963 feet per second. They had a practical rate of fire of 180 rounds per minute. This device was known as a Nebelwerfer 
and there are a number of different sizes of this rocket firing field artillery 15 and 21. Initially designed to deliver poison gas and smoke, high explosive rounds were developed for them. The thin walls of the rockets allowed greater amounts of explosive to be used. The 15cm Nebelwerfer had a 70 pound shell with a maximum range of 4.3 miles. The muzzle velocity was 1,120 feet per second. The 21 inch Nebelwerfer fired a 241 pound shell with a muzzle velocity of 1,000 feet per second, 4.8 miles. The visual shows the Omaha Beach landing area divided up into sections Charlie, Dog Green, White Red, Easy Green, Easy Red, and finally Fox Green and Fox Red. Behind the beach there are a number of small settlements shaded green. As seen earlier, this is the D1 draw leading to Verville, the exit which, most importantly for getting logistics off the beach in the near future, had the most developed road. This is D3, the group of houses then known as Les Moulins. E1, the exit leading to Saint Laurent. E3, the exit leading to Colville. And finally, the smallest exit there known as F1 Caberg. The beach defences were designed at the same time to complement and support each other, which is different from other beaches in D-Day where defences often evolved as equipment became available. The defences were organised into resistance desks, which are identified by the prefix WN and numbered 60 through 73. One of the most powerful and feared guns of the time was the 88mm Pack 43-41 and the Beats had two of these at WN-72 and WN-61 providing mutual supporting fire and infrared fire along the length of the beach into the sides of invading forces when they would be there at their most exposed. WN-72 and WN-71 worked in cooperation to provide crossfire and killing zones for the D1 exit below Verville. The D1 exit was the most fortified sector on Omaha Beach, probably because of the quality of the road. In WN72 was the best constructed point on Omaha Beach as the Germans had housed the 88mm in a casement protected from the sea by a 7 foot screen of reinforced concrete casement type 8667 able to keep out naval gunfire from destroyers and cruisers. They also had a 50mm KWK L42 in this position, also protected by a casement. These casements were connected by trenches. Three MG34s, 42s, heavy machine guns were placed on the hill overlooking the landing ground, sighted at a perfect distance. Additionally, on the beach, an anti-tank wall blocked the road, which was the same at all four of the main exits. Around the strong point, there was barbed wire and mines. On the opposite side of the D1 vertical draw was WN71. WN71 was situated on the hill above the Verville Valley and covered its eastern side and the seafront. The position had two 8cm mortars and a Tobruk at the rear of the position with an MG34. Another Tobruk with an MG34 was positioned on the right protecting its flank. Multiple machine guns were sighted on the edge of the hill overlooking the beach within trench works. Further west of Beerville, WN73 was also covering the beach. This was the site of a house with an older 75mm anti-tank gun set on a small bunker. This was not visible from the seaside. There were a number of machine guns overlooking the beach alongside 8cm mortars. WN70 continues the trench system along the top of the bluffs with four machine guns positioned to fire onto the beach. This secured the open stretch of field between Saint Laurent and Verville. There was two 75mm field cannon, one in an open emplacement and the other in a partly completed casement. The position was complete with two 8cm mortars and a 20mm flat gun. Further along is Les Moulins which was covered by WN-68 and WN-66. There was an anti-tank wall blocking the dirt road. WN-68 had a number of casements in the process of being built with a network of trenches to connect the bunkers. There was a 50mm field gun in emplacement and a 50mm anti-tank gun. Just behind the beach was a Tobruk with a Panzerport turret 
and on the bluffs were two more to Brooks with Renault R35 turrets. There was a concrete structure on the bluff with two gun slits. There was also a Nebelwerfer emplacement. An anti tank ditch ran between WN66 and WN68. A concrete wall sealed off the road leading up the D3 draw. There was a house left in this location which was defended and had a bunker in the cellar with a machine gun position. There were trenches on top of the bluff along with two 50mm guns, one which was an emplacement and the other was one of the latest KWK L60s. As well as this, there was Tobruk's protecting two mortars and two Renault R35 turrets. WN67 was set behind WN66 and this had a Nebelwerfer site in wooden launchers, although the rockets themselves may not have arrived yet. There was also a command bunker at this location. WN69 was located in Salonon and had two artillery pieces of German origin, a 50mm anti-tank gun and a heavy machine gun. At E1, WN65 and WN64 covered the San Laurent draw itself. WN65 had a 75mm pack 3536 slightly up the valley. Situated right on the beach was one of the 50mm KWKs and a 50mm pack with trenches and machine guns. Two mortars were, were situated up on the hill. WN64 was quite a small defence consisting of trenches and earth bunkers potentially being the beach's weakest point. It had a 20mm flak unit and a Russian 76.2 infantry field gun. There were two Dubrooks with mortars. WN62 and WN61 covered the E3 Colville exit. WN62 was the strongest position of the beach and was known as the Butcher of Omaha, with two casements with 75mm guns overlooking the beach with an anti-tank ditch in front. There were extensive trenches with machine guns along the top of the bluff. Two 50mm anti-tank guns were positioned, one on top of the hill, the other towards the back of the draw. The position also had 8cm and 5cm mortars. It had observation equipment and communications linked to a battery of 105 calibre weapons. The names Ursula, Anna and Frida marked predetermined targets for this artillery to fire onto the beach. An artillery observer could request the batteries to fire on these targets. WN61 was also fronted by anti-tank trenches on the beach. WN61 had the other 88 situated to provide flanking fire along the length of the beach. Again it was protected by a bunker similar to the 88 at WN72. There was Tobruk's protecting a 50mm anti-tank gun, a 35mm tank turret and machine guns. This position was also equipped with flamethrower equipment. Behind WN61 at Colville was WN63, a command post with a 50mm anti-tank gun and a machine gun nest. On a little hill east of Colville lies WN60. This position had deep trenches with a 75mm field gun located in a pillbox. There was also a 20mm flat gun with Tobruk's mounting mortars. Flamethrower units were also at this resistance point. I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Next time we will look at how the Allies prepared Omaha for the beach landings and how the initial waves fared.